All right, gang, welcome to chapter six. We're going to talk today about healthcare financing. Uh, this is kind of my special area of interest uh, within healthcare. So uh, pardon me if I get a little excited about it. I'm bringing back uh, the quad model again, because we're going to frame a lot of what we're talking about here still around the quad model. And I wanted to spend just a little bit more time kind of talking about the individual components because I feel like I'm, maybe that hasn't been completely clear. So to try to add to this, we're gonna talk about each of these sections. We're gonna kind of leave delivery by itself, but we're gonna talk about the other three sections in a little bit of detail. So when we think about financing, um, and I wanna be really specific when we're talking about financing as in the quad model is a specific meaning uh, versus kind of when we use the term financing in sort of a loosey goosey way about maybe it means payment, maybe it means who's actually bringing the cash to the table, you know, maybe it means something else. So we're going to kind of refine a little bit about what do we mean by this. So in the quad model, when we say financing, we're really asking who's paying for this. Um, and I don't mean who's writing the check to the provider. I mean, who's, who is, whose pocket is the money coming out of? And so you can think about it in a couple of ways, a true, pure um, uh, 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 market model might have, you know, um, would probably have a lot of individuals paying for their own care directly. So you'd have individuals, and this is historical. So, you know, going pre-health insurance. So back before 1960, um, there was no insurance, right? So there was no health insurance for most people. Um, and so and and so payment and financing were all done by the individual. So you would call your, if you got sick, you'd go see your family physician. Um, and then your family physician would say, okay, today's visit was $10 or two chickens and, um, you know, a side of beef or something, uh, depending on where you were and what you were doing. Uh, uh, that changed, right, with, in the 60s when we had uh, kind of a progression of Medicare and Medicaid really came online, and then uh, private insurance really took off during that period. And this is a period where the average American family was becoming much more wealthy post-World War II. The average American family became very, you know, we moved from being kind of lower middle income in the world to top of the income, uh, top you know, our family incomes, our household incomes, our household family incomes were, you know, in the top of the, of the world distribution. So you can imagine a world where individuals pay and there are still some very, very wealthy individuals. So like Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, they don't need health insurance. They just, you know, go get their care and then they write a check um, or they have one of their people write a check most likely, right? Most people who have healthcare insurance have their insurance through their employer. So their employer nominally pays. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what does that mean, right? To have uh, you know, employer, employer pay. And then you have uh, governments can also be financing. And then you could have potentially a blend. Some people have, you know, both some sort of government payment as well as maybe employer-based or individual-based, depending on what you're talking about. And this could also vary between where we've mostly been focused on um, healthcare insurance in the sense that healthcare is in like medical insurance. I've, I've only kind of given, and I'm going to continue to only give kind of a cursory uh, discussion of uh, dental insurance um, and uh, opt optometry related, you know, so, so vision insurance. These are kind of peripheral services. I'm really, you know, mostly discussing um, uh, I'm mostly discussing healthcare insurance in the sense of medical insurance, but that, but like, if you wear glasses and probably a lot of you do, most of your um, vision bills are out of pocket. So it's you uh, dealing with the optometrist and paying the fees for the optometry for your eye exam, and then going to you know some some place that makes glasses and paying cash again for. Um, uh, for your eyeglasses or your contact lenses. Some people do have vision insurance. For example, I can buy vision insurance uh, as a faculty member from uh, from UNH, and I do because it's a pretty good deal, um, but it's a separate uh, insurance plan from my medical insurance. Um, so 
kind of really, I'm not saying it, but I am kind of ignoring dental and um, vision uh, plans. But that would be an example of where a lot of individuals will have health insurance, for example, and then they will pay out of pocket direct, you know, direct relationship with their provider for vision care. And so that's an example where your financing and your payment are all integrated. And so it's you as an individual dealing with your provider. Um, so let's talk a little bit about when employers pay. What does that mean? So a lot of people tend to think, oh, if you have a good job, you get good benefits and, you know, uh, health insurance is like free um, from your from your employer. Um, and in fact, it's not. Uh, uh, so even if your employer pays 100% of your health insurance benefit, it's not really free to you. And the reason is an, an employer looks at you and says, what's the cost of employing this individual? And the cost, what they total up is basically your wages, and your benefits and the cost, the cost of those two things to them. So wages, cash, right? The, the actual cash that comes to you, that's a cost to them. Um, and then whatever benefits they give you is another cost to your employer. So if they, if they help you, um, if they subsidize your health insurance or they pay it completely, um, that's a cost to the employer. And a lot of times, employers will pay part of the healthcare premium and leave part of it to the employee. And it's still I'm still making it sound like somehow it's free. It's really not. But there's a bunch of other benefits that they have to weigh into when they're considering hiring an employee. And things like, you know, common things when you're you graduate, no, I'm not, you're not getting a lot of these things. You're probably sitting there like, well, I work at the restaurant part-time and I don't get any benefits. Well, that's true. But when you, you know, when hopefully you graduate from college and you get that fabulous first job um, uh, with some big company making a bunch of money, they're going to pay you cash and then they're going to give you a bunch of benefits that are really cool, like health insurance, life insurance, some sort of retirement plan, maybe disability insurance. Maybe they'll offer child care on site, elder care, probably not something you're worried about yet, but you know, I'm at, I'm getting to a point where my folks, uh, my wife's folks and my folks are both, uh, getting up there and they're good now, but maybe at some point I'll need to be able to put, you know, my father in a adult daycare during the, um, uh, during the day so that I can work or my mother, you know, or we might have whatever. It, 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 there, there are responsibilities as you get older. You know, first you start with your kids, then later on you worry about your parents. It's a, it's a funny world. Um, and then other perks that cost the, the firm money that they actually consider, things that, you know, you might not even think of as a benefit, but for example, having a nice office, right? Um, or having uh, nice equipment, nice desk, nice office chair, uh, even a nice boss, right? You have to pay your boss, your your employee bosses better to say you have good bosses, uh, and then basic things like access to a cafeteria. These are things you might not think of as a benefit, but your employer does, and and they consider it part of the cost of employing, uh, of having employees. Um, and, you know, I mean, backing up for a second, you know, nice office, nice equipment. I mean, think about the fact what we've been through just recently <clears throat> with COVID, right? Renting offices costs a lot of money. It's actually a huge cost savings to send everybody home and have them work in their own, you know, have them provide their own offices, right? So you can shut down all that real expensive real estate in downtown Boston or downtown New York. I mean, a lot of that's, a lot of those buildings have been standing empty because all of the uh, all of the people have been working from home. So that's just another example that you should think about, right? Because that's a, that real estate is a real cost. Um, uh, and so let's, uh, let's take a case. <clears throat> Imagine um, uh, 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 you have a hundred thousand dollar job, right? Or your job, you have a job and your employer is willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars in uh, wages and benefits. So, they are willing to either pay you $100,000 cash or give you $90,000 in cash and a health insurance plan that costs the employer $10,000. And they're and at that point, they're indifferent. Your employer is indifferent. 
it's going to cost them $100,000 to employ you. And it doesn't really matter to them whether they pay you $100,000 in cash or they pay you $90,000 in cash and then they pay for your health insurance. So, but that's really what happens, right? As the employer adds on benefits um, for you, they, they reduce your cash wages. And, and this is a reality that a lot of, uh, I find a lot of uh, healthcare policy advocates kind of just ignore, like, like it's somehow, you know, um, uh, 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 employers just kind of pull the healthcare um, uh, costs out of the air, uh, but it's really not. So, so if you have robust, generous benefits, chances are your employer would be perfectly willing to pay you more cash um, if you would agree not to take the benefits. So, which would you prefer? Would you prefer $100,000 in cash or $90,000 in cash and a $10,000 health insurance co- health insurance plan? Well, you might prefer the second one, the one where you get less cash, but then your employer pays your health insurance because of the way that the federal government taxes you, taxes your income. So let's imagine uh, the second option where you're getting um uh, the ten thousand dollar plan. So, um, health insurance. If your employer pays for your health insurance, you don't have to pay taxes on that ten thousand dollars. So, let's assume you're in the twenty eight percent tax bracket. That means that uh, your last uh, dollars are charged at uh, you pay twenty eight percent in um, uh, tax on. So, if you're getting just the hundred thousand dollars cash. And I'm using 100,000 because it makes the math easy. So 28% of 100,000 is $28,000. That's how much uh, tax you would have to pay to the federal government. Um, But if you are only getting paid $90,000 in cash, the government still taxes you at 28%, but 28% of 90,000 is only 25.2,000. And the federal government doesn't collect any taxes on the $10,000 in health insurance benefits that you've gotten. And so you're actually better off in this scenario by letting your employer pay for your health insurance, assuming you would have bought it anyway. You're, You're better off letting your employer pay for that health insurance because you wind up shielding, um, $2,800, $2.8K, $2,800 $2,800, 2800000 k $2,800 from, from taxes. You reduce your tax burden by shifting some of your compensation from cash and into uh, health insurance. And so you're effectively making $102,800 you $102, by allowing your employer to pay for something that you would have paid for after tax. So like if you make the $100,000 in cash and then you have to go out and pay um, for health insurance, you're still paying $10,000 for that health insurance, right? Um, But now you're paying for it with what we call after tax dollars. So you'd be paying um, that $10,000 after tax, you'd have $72,000, right? Because you'd pay 100,000 minus your 28,000, you'd have $72,000 left. And you'd then have to, from that 72,000, you would have to pay $10,000 for health insurance. So you'd be down to 62,000. Um, uh, so that's, you know, uh, uh, so there's a benefit here. The point is there's a benefit, a tax benefit to the employee to allow the employer to pay for some of their benefits like health insurance. Okay. So the employer though, kind of coming back to my main argument, the employer could care less. They don't care either way. Doesn't matter to them. And, you know, they may talk it up like they're, you know, really generous and kind and they care about their employees and all that, but really it comes down to, they don't care um, uh, 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 whether they pay you a hundred thousand dollars in cash or they pay you $90,000 in cash and $10,000 in benefits. See, I, I'm a free market guy, but I'm not a I'm not a pro business guy necessarily, right? So, because I can see, I see government doing dumb things uh, or or self self interested things, and I see big businessmen doing and women doing self interested greedy things too. Uh, so, uh, uh, so they're all, you know, we got to keep our eyes out because, uh, as um, you know, as James Madison said, uh, 
you know, none of us are angels, right? So that was from that previous lecture, right? If, if, if men were to, uh, you know, what was it? If, if men were, if angels were to run the government and if men were angels, we wouldn't need a government. And if, and if uh, the government was run by angels, we wouldn't have to worry about things. Well, same in business, right? The same people that run the government are the same people that run your businesses. Um, and so none of them are angels. All right. So when we think about government financing, though, so we say, well, so a bunch of you have said, I think the government should pay. Well, what do you mean by that when you say, I think the government should pay for health care? Right. So, OK. Um, so government, when we say that, what we're mean, what we're saying is the government is going to use its its ability to tax, right, to collect cash from citizens uh, using some mechanism. Maybe that's an income tax. Maybe it's a property tax. Maybe it's a sales tax. Right. There's all these different ways that you can tax people. Um, you can, uh, you know, you have a restaurant tax. I mean, you just go on and on. Think about all the ways that you know, all the ways that the government, you know, nickels and dimes you um, for for uh, to 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 generate revenue so that it can then provide, hopefully, provide services that you value. Um, but when you say the government, what do you mean by the government? Do you mean the federal government? Right, the government out of Washington D.C., uh, or do you mean your state, your county, your town or city, um, your well, whatever you know, um, your health board? Right, there are all these different levels of government that you could, if you say, I think the government should pay. Well, what do you mean exactly when you say that? So there are different programs um, where the government does pay. So for example, we have a bunch of federal programs. I'm going to talk a little more about Medicare. And we've talked a little bit about Medicare and Medicaid uh, at this point, but I'm going to talk some more about it because it's really, really important. Um, but you know, federal programs, so paid. So when we say, when we're in that financing, we're saying, who should finance care? Well, the federal government finances care through programs like Medicare. Um, the Veterans Administration has the Veterans Health Administration, sort of subordinate entity. Uh, we have the military health system. So that's the organization that pays for all your active duty, uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, uh, Coast Guardsmen, well, not Coast Guardsmen, because uh, they're technically uh, 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 Homeland Security. Um, uh, uh, and retirees like me. Um, and, and then you have Indian health services. So if you are, uh, if you live on a, um, uh, Indian reservation, you could potentially, uh, assuming you are Indian, you could qualify for, uh, or Native American, I should say, even though it's the Indian health services, sorry. If you are Native American, uh, and you are living on a reservation, you can be covered by the Indian Health Services. I, I wonder when they're gonna change that name to modernize it a bit. And there are a bunch of other cats and dogs that are smaller, these are the big ones. Uh, and then you have some situations where you have uh, combined federal and state programs, Medicaid being the biggest one, where it's a combination of funding, uh, of funding and financing from the federal government and financing from the state. And then you have state and local programs that you know vary from state to state, um, and some of them are insurance-based programs. Uh, some of them uh, provide direct care. So I've mentioned uh, in in past lectures that my sister is a family medicine doc. She works down in in, the, in Philadelphia, and she works for a clinic that is owned and operated by the city of Philadelphia. So she is a, a employee of the city of Philadelphia um, and she takes care of low income uh, uh, people. She's in uh, she's uh, 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 works in a um, predominantly Hispanic area. She speaks uh, fluent Spanish. This is part, part of why she, she got the job and why she loves it so much because she loves the Spanish culture, Hispanic Latin culture. Um, and so she works with, you know, most of her, her, um, uh, most of her patients are, are speak primarily speak Spanish. Um, so that's an example of a city level, uh, program, uh, financed by the city, probably with some federal money mixed in there. And this is where government financing gets messy because the federal government has its fingers into so many different things. So when we say financing, right, we can think um, individual, right? So individual can finance it. So if you're uh, super wealthy, like Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, right, 
Amazon and Facebook founders. Um, chances are you finance your own care. You don't bother with insurance. You don't, and payment is just you writing a check to your provider. Even if you're not super wealthy like that, there are probably some components of healthcare that you just pay out of pocket. Um, that uh, vision is a good example of that, but also self-care stuff. Like, you know, when you go to write, you know, if you're like, I've got, you know, some allergies, I'm just going to go down to Rite Aid and pay for um, uh, over-the-counter uh, allergy medication. I'm not going to bother going to see a doctor to get myself some, you know, Allegra knockoff um, uh, uh, uh uh, medication, I'm just going to go to Rite Aid and buy it. And that, so that's an example of healthcare that you are just as an individual financing, individually paying for and working directly with the provider. Um, then you have employers. And remember, this you know, idea of, of, of total compensation includes wages and benefits, benefits being including things like health insurance, your employer is going to reduce your cash wages um, to pay for your health benefits. In fact, you may have heard that uh, a lot of some economists uh, say that there's been wage stagnation, meaning the average family isn't earning uh, in more inflation in inflation adjusted terms. But if you adjust for the fact that healthcare has become so much more expensive uh, in uh, in the last couple of decades, um, employers are contributing more and more and more money uh, uh, in the form of healthcare benefits uh, on behalf of their employees, and so that's swallowing up the um, the increases in in healthcare benefits are swallowing up much of the increases that they would that the employees would have gotten in the form of wages. So if health healthcare costs go up by $10,000 next year, in our example here, or was it in our example here, right? Um, the employer could say, well, uh, I could give you, you know, I was going to give you a $10,000 raise next year, but what I'm going to do instead is cover your I'm going to, your, your health insurance now costs $20,000. So I'm not going to give you a raise, but I am going to pay your $20,000 health insurance bill. So it looks like you didn't get a raise that year. Um, but in fact, the employer is paying 10% more, right? 10% uh, uh, on a hundred thousand is 10,000. So they're paying because they're paying that additional $10,000 for your health insurance you really did effectively, your, your cost to your employer has risen by 10%, even though your wages, your cash wages are flat. So when we adjust for, um, when we adjust for uh, uh, healthcare inflation, most uh, workers are actually making more money uh, than they did you know, in prior decades. It's just that, um, or they're making more total compensation, I should say. Their wages might be flat, but the total compensation, when you add up the, the cash that they bring home, as well as the cost of the benefits that they get, they're actually better off. Okay, so we've talked about financing. Now we're moving on to that next bubble in the, the quad model, insurance. So I really wanna hammer on this idea of insurance. Um, I kind of said it before, but healthcare insurance is, is not really insurance, kind of going back to that um, uh, Princess Bride picture. Uh, uh, or meme that I showed a while back. I said, you know, um, you use this word, but I don't think you know what it means or something like that, right? So, so we call health insurance insurance, but it's really a combination package of insurance, true pure insurance and prepaid expenses. So insurance operates on four basic principles. And this is really important for you to understand as a, um, uh, as a, you know, uh, for this class as a potential health policy, a person who has an interest in health policy, which is pretty much should be pretty much every American, but also just as a functional adult, you should understand these principles of insurance because you're going to be presented with the issue of purchasing insurance uh, throughout your life, uh, whether it's health insurance, car insurance, home insurance, so on and so forth, insurance for your iPhone. Um, so four things, right? First, uh, uh, risk 
insurance is all about transferring risk. So risk for something to be insurance, the risk has to be unpredictable at the individual level. So I don't know if tomorrow I'm going to break my leg or not, but I'd like to have insurance to cover that cost in case that happens. I do, however, know that on June 7th, I'm going in for a annual physical. I'm not, but I'm making that up, right? Um, so, and my annual physical is pretty predictable. It happens annually, hence the name. Um, uh, so that's not something, even though my insurance pays for my annual physical, it's not really insurance, right? Because it's completely predictable. It's an annual physical. Ladies, you get your annual exam, right? Um, so, uh, uh, these are predictable expenses. When you turn 50, you get to have a colonoscopy. Yay me, right? Um, and then I get it to have it again because I had some some stuff showed up. They're like, yeah, you've got to come back in three years. So I've got a, a completely predictable now um, uh, schedule uh, in which I need these different services, right? It, dental, you go every six months to get a cleaning, hopefully. Um, you know, those are completely predictable expenses. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, uh, I fall down and break my leg, I get, uh, I catch a, a serious disease, COVID, something like that, and I require hospitalization. Um, those are those are unpredictable. So you would insure against the latter stuff. You would insure against breaking your leg, getting COVID, you know, having a stroke. Um, but you, but things that are predictable, like your semi-annual dental exam, your annual um, uh, well woman exam, your annual general physical, uh, your uh, colonoscopy at 50, 60, 70, you know, your mammogram starting at 40, I think it is now. Those, those things are all predictable and wouldn't necessarily, uh, they don't, you wouldn't insure against them. You don't insure against them, um, even though, our insurance companies, we use our insurance companies to pay for those expenses. So those are not really true insurance insurable events. So the risk, you know, one of the things about insurance is risk can't be predicted at the individual level. I don't know if I'm going to go break my leg tomorrow, but you know what? If we take 100,000 people, we can make a pretty good prediction of how many people are going to break their leg this year. It'll be some number. Right, and if I was an epidemiologist or um, an insurance executive, I'd probably know that number off the top of my head. Uh, and so, when you get into big groups, things that are unpredictable at the individual level become very predictable as a result of what's called the law of large numbers. Um, and so, insurance companies like to have big numbers of of covered lives of people that they're that are buying their insurance. Uh, pro, uh, uh, benefits from them, right? Insurance plans from them. Uh, uh, because the larger the number in the population, the more predictable the utilization is going to be. And it allows them to spread uh, costs in a more meaningful way. So, in, And so speaking of spreading costs, insurance transfers risk from the individual to the group through a process called pooling. So let's say, you know, me, you know, by myself, I'm an individual. Um, you know, I don't have any idea how likely I am to break my leg, but I join a pool of 100,000 people and the insurance people, uh, the actuaries, that's what, that's what these people are that work in an insurance company and they make these predictions are called actuaries. Um, they've got a pretty good idea that out of 100,000 people, there'll be, you know, 1,000 people will, will break a bone next year and we'll need to pay for that. And so since they don't know if it's going to be Bonica or it's going to be Smith or it's going to be Jones, what they do is they take the cost of a thousand people breaking their leg, right? So they take a thousand times whatever the cost is. Let's say that's, you know, $2,000. So they take a thousand times 2000. So that's $2 million. And they spread that $2 million over a hundred thousand people. And everybody shares in the actual loss. That's this, right? So we don't know at the outset, which of us is going to break our leg. So we all contribute to the pool. We are all pooled together. We contribute some money to the pool and we all in effect absorb the cost of a thousand broken legs um, with the hope that it won't be us. But if it is us, we won't have to pay, you know, or we won't be hurt by the, uh, the cost. It'll hurt, but it won't hurt financially, 
All right. So these ideas apply to pure insurance, right? And health insurance, as I said, is a hybrid of both insurance and prepayment. So let's do an actual insurance example. So we have Archibald. Uh, he's a big skier and he knows he has, he believes he has a, a maybe, and, and importantly, let's say he actually has a one in hundred chance of breaking his leg. And the cost of care would be $30,000 if he breaks his leg. So Without insurance, he's got a 99% chance of, of having no cost and a 1% chance of having a $30,000 cost. That's a pretty bad broken leg, but you know. Um, and since he only makes $50,000 a year, a $30,000 um, uh, uh, payment would be pretty devastating. Could is a good chance that if he's got to pay that, that 20, 000, the, with the $20,000 he's got left over, he might not be able to make rent, might not be able to feed, him, feed himself, right? So it might leave him, wind up uh, making him homeless. Uh, he might go bankrupt, so on. So um, so it's important to for, for Archibald to consider buying insurance. And there's a, just a, I should have thrown this on the next page, but it's a general life advice. Don't buy insurance against losses that you can afford to absorb. So a lot of times, like you're going through, uh, you go to Best Buy and you're going to buy like a, you know, $50 pair of uh, 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 headphones and like, would you like to buy uh, insurance, you know, two-year replacement plan for $10? Well, chances are you won't need it. Um, and why are you insuring, why are you paying $10 to insure against a $50 loss? Chances are even you as poor college students can afford uh, to absorb a $50 loss, and it's probably not worth paying $10 to insure against it. So take that into consideration. I have, uh, uh, I haven't talked to you much about my minivan, but one of the things I like to joke about is I have a, a 2004 um, minivan uh, that I drive. I inherited it from my wife. We bought it new. She drove it for about eight years, and then it became mine. I got her a new car. I got the old minivan. Um, and so I'm driving that 17 year old minivan, uh, that's worth about $500, uh, drives just gets me from point A to point B. I'm not very stylish. Um, you know, the doors work most of the time. Uh, and that's all I care about, right? Do I have collision insurance on that car? Absolutely not. Right. If I crash that car, the insurance company is going to be like, that car's worth $500. You have a $500 deductible. We owe you nothing. Um, so, uh, but even if I had a five, you know, uh, even if I was insuring, even if they would be willing to give me $500, I got, I had, this, you know, no deductible. Um, is it really worth it to me to pay insurance to insure something that is worth $500? And the answer on a car, and the answer is no. Um, been driving it for 17 years uh, and I've yet to hit anything with it. So I'm pretty, um, you know, um, pretty good with it. And if I do, and I, um, and as long as I'm able to walk away, I'll be good. All right. So let's talk about this insurance example some more about Archibald, right? So dear old Archibald decides to get into a pool of other skiers who have the same chance of getting hit, uh, hurt and the same potential costs. And they contact an insurance company who says, sure, we'll underwrite your, uh, um, uh, plan and underwriting means that they're going to take the risk on. So the insurance company, the process of underwriting is they evaluate the risk and then they come up with a, a price um, to charge you, which is called a premium. So they he turn they turn around uh, to Archibald and say, "We'll charge you three hundred fifty three dollars." Uh, Archibald and his hundred friends will charge you three hundred fifty three dollars for the ski season, um, based on your risk and our costs. So how do they come up with this? Well. We said a minute ago that Archibald has a one in a hundred chance of breaking his leg. And if he does, he'll be a, have a $30,000 uh, expense. And so to calculate the expected medical loss, what we do is we take the probability of the loss, which in this case is 1%, so I'm using 0.01, times the, times the expected loss, which in this case uh, uh, is $30,000. And so we come up with an expected value, what we call an expected value, uh, which in this case would be the expected medical loss. So $300. So at the beginning of the season, Archibald has a $300, basically has a, an expected medical loss of $300. Now, what we know is Archibald is either going to have a zero loss or a $30,000 loss. He doesn't have a, there's no option here for him to have a $300 loss. But if he buys a 
this health insurance plan, um, he creates a statistical uh, expected medical loss of $300. Now you're saying, well, if it's going to be $300, why does the insurance company want $353? Well, aside from the fact that they're greedy um, uh, and want to make a profit, uh, they also have expenses for doing this, right? This, this process of underwriting requires an underwriter who, by the way, has to be paid wages and probably expects to have uh, health insurance as part of his job, right? So, um, so there, it isn't free for the health insurance company to provide, or for this insurance company, whatever it is, to provide this insurance, right? Because there's real costs to them doing it. Aside from the medical loss that they expect to incur, there are administrative costs as well as they need a profit, right? Otherwise, why would they be in this business? Um, so they have to make, they have to cover their administrative costs. They have to pay their actuary, right? They have to pay their um, accountants and so forth. And then they need to make a profit because that's what businesses exist to do. Um, so we have this thing called a medical loss ratio, which basically means that what portion of the premium is going to be spent on actually covering the medical losses that the insurance company has. And the ACA requires that large, um, uh, large, uh, health insurance companies covering large plans or large groups has, have to maintain a medical loss ratio of 85% or less, uh, or excuse me, or more. So, so that means that they have to spend at least 85% of the premiums that they collect on actually paying for care for their, for their beneficiaries. They could pay 90% and that'd be okay, but they can't pay 70% uh, of the premium. So the idea is that they aren't milking you um, for money that they don't need. Um, so the idea is they're, they're protecting you I, in, in an ideal world. Um, they're protecting you. Um, so how do we calculate this? Well, we say, if I say I have to have an 85% medical loss ratio, what I'm saying is 85% of the premium has to equal the medical loss. So when we calculate um, the premium that Archibald is going to have to pay or that the insurance company is going to charge, um, they consider the medical loss is expected to be $300. So 85% of the premium has to equal $30. So if you take the medical loss times the premium, the medical loss rate uh, times the premium, or excuse me, medical loss ratio times the premium, that will give you the, the expected medical loss. And so you take, you divide both sides by 0.85. So 0.85 divided by 0.85, 300 divided by 0.85. You get 0.85 divided by 0.85 is one, that gives you the premium. Over here, you've got 300 divided by 0.85, that gives you 353. So that's where the 353 comes from, um, is the medical loss plus the administrative costs and profit that the insurance company needs to um, uh, in order to stay in business. All right, so now you try. Um, uh, so Ruben is a race car driver. He's got a two in, 1, 000, two in 1,000 chance of a catastrophic accident that would likely have medical bills of $250,000, blah, blah, blah. We're using an MLR of 80%, medical loss ratio of 80%. What would Ruben's premium be? All right, so you should pause and do this quick calculation. You can flip back and look at the slide I did a minute ago. All right, so I'm gonna pause here for a second and we're back. All right, so uh, I hope you stopped and tried to do it. So here's, so first we calculate what is Ruben's expected medical loss. Well, he's got a two in 100,000 chance of a $250,000 medical bill. What does that translate into? $500. So Ruben, statistically speaking, Going into the season, Ruben's got a $500 um, medical expense. In reality, he's either got zero or $250,000. I don't know about you, but I can't afford to absorb $250,000 out of pocket. Um, so, uh, so I would, if I were Ruben, I'd want to buy health insurance, right? And so to figure out, so Ruben's got this $500, $500 medical loss. So people, so an insurance company looking to insure people like Ruben would take that 
medical loss and they'd say, all right, our MLR is 0.8. So we take 0.8 times the expected premium has got to equal 500. So solving that little equation, we divide both sides by 0.8, 500 divided by 0.8 is 625. So Ruben's um, uh, uh, insurance premium would be 625, all right? Um, so we've been talking about insurance. We've been talking about uh, um, uh, financing. Let's talk about that third bubble payment. So payment is different than financing. Um, and it's and payment is more than who writes the check to the provider. That's you know relatively simple uh, 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 piece of this. So so what we what we really care about, yes, somebody's got to write the the check to the provider. Um, but you could imagine, um, and 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 in reality, we do have uh, cash only practices. So primary care, we have a thing called uh, an, an emerging trend called direct primary care, where a primary care doctor, say a a family medicine doctor, hangs out a shingle and says, "I don't take um, I don't take insurance." End of discussion. Instead, what I do is I have a subscription model where you pay me $60 a month, $75 a month, $100 a month, whatever it is. And for that $100 a month, you can come see me whenever you want, right? You can see me twice a year. You can see me every month. You can come by once a week. You can call me on my cell phone. You can email me. You can fax me questions if you want to, if you're really a total 80s nerd. Um, but for that hundred bucks a month, you get basically unlimited access, right? So that's called direct primary care. Another variation on that is called concierge medicine, which is sort of this hybrid model of, I mean, it depends on what you, so there's a lot of kind of muddiness about what this, these mean, but another variation on this is you pay a subscription on top of a fee for service charge that gives you kind of enhanced access um, uh, uh, to your primary care provider. Um, and many mental health providers don't take insurance at all and only take cash. Um, so there's there's a lot uh, of there's a lot out there of people who basically cut out the insurance function. They don't want to deal with insurance companies at all, um, and they just deal with. Uh, uh, they say, patient, you can come see me, finance it yourself, uh, and you pay me yourself. Um, so, so, but making the payment is a relatively simple thing, right? We say, okay, how much is it? How much is the service? Well, it's a hundred dollars a visit. Okay. Let me write you a check for a hundred dollars done. Um, what actually is important about the payment function and why it's done by insurance companies is because the payment function includes the negotiating of with the, with the provider for a price, right? So what I just described, oh, how much is the cost. It's a hundred dollars. Okay. I'll pay that. I didn't even negotiate. Right. Um, now I could, I'd be like, well, how about $87? And probably I'd be like, how about $92? All right. How about $90? All right. Sold. Right. Maybe. Or they could just say, get the hell out of my office. I'm not going to see you. I said, the price is a hundred. Right. Well, in which case that negotiation's over. Um, most of us aren't especially comfortable with doing that sort of thing, particularly with our healthcare providers. Uh, so we're more comfortable with letting the insurance do that. Right. So, so this is, so insurance companies really, most of us uh, uh, deal with insurance companies. When we think of insurance companies as covering all our costs, right, it's because we combine together the insurance function and the payment function. And in particular, within the payment function, the negotiation of costs, right, with the provider. So the insurance company negotiates with our provider uh, on a cost, and we don't even really know what that is, or we're not paying a whole lot of attention to it, because chances are we're only paying a small fraction of, of that cost that goes directly to the provider. So why an insurance company? Well, you know, to the, the payment function really requires specialized knowledge and market power. So specialized knowledge in the sense that health insurance companies know are paid, you pay them to know a lot about healthcare and how much things should cost. 
if you only go to the doctor a few times a year and they say, hey, you know what, you really need to go get an ultrasound scan of your belly um, because we're worried that maybe you have kidney stones or something like that, right? You have no idea. How much, how much would you pay for that? You know, uh, you could totally get taken advantage of. And so it's, it's, it's more efficient for you to work with an insurance company who spends all day long, every day, has a whole team of people thinking about how much should things cost, right? And then insurance companies, so they're paid, you pay insurance companies to know these things, right? Um, uh, it's like Tyrion Lannister, right? I, what is it? I, I drink and I know things or something. I drink wine and I know things, right? So insurance companies take your money and they know things. Um, uh, uh, so, so health insurance also, companies also represent large groups of patients typically, and they can use both their knowledge, right? and their size to negotiate better prices. And so um, having to be effective in negotiations, you have to actually have something to threaten the provider with, not in like a mean way, but just like, you know, if I wanted to argue with one of these, these cash only providers and I said, well, I don't wanna pay you a hundred dollars. They just tell me go somewhere else then, right? Cause I don't have any market power to negotiate with them. Uh, and that's what they want. Most of them go into these direct primary care or concierge medicine because they're tired of getting pushed around by insurance companies that do have market power because they represent thousands or tens of thousands of people in their area. And, you know, if you either take, you know, what an insurance company can do, an insurance company like Cigna, for example, that has the UNH contract can go to a local provider and say, hey, we're going to pay you $100 for a visit, right? Um, and we understand that you'd really like 150, but too bad, we're going to pay you 100. Uh, and you're going to like it. And that's called having market power, right? So we like to work through insurance companies to have them do our payment function, because they have specialized knowledge, and they have market power. So I want to give you some examples of just to kind of highlight, you know, um, uh, uh, some costs that you as an individual wouldn't know about, right? So let's just say, so I've, I've used MRI as an example before, right? A basic MRI in the United States has been reported a, uh, a, a range of $400, right? As the price to $5,700. And even within like the Seacoast area, I was looking for a study, I couldn't find a, a handy, a study uh, that would show, you know, some of the variants, but there's huge variants, even within a community. Like if you, if, even within the Seacoast area, you probably have a range of $500 to $2,000, depending on which provider you go to and say, how much would an MRI be? So how are you going to know which one to go to? Um, so your insurance company, you know, you call, you, you go to see your physician, you're like, ah, my knee hurts. And they look at it and they're like, yeah, okay, we're going to order an MRI because we think maybe you've damaged some tissue uh, in your knee, soft tissue in your knee. MRI, like I said, you know, previously is really good at, at looking at soft tissue damage, uh, whereas a x-ray is, is less effective. Right. So they send you, they say, so they tell you, go get an MRI. Um, so if you don't have insurance, your doc tells you you need an MRI, you go and you'd be like, all right, well, I guess, you know, the nearest hospital, I guess that's where I'll go. Then you call them up, book the MRI, and it turns out they bill you $2,000 and you have to pay $2,000. If you have health insurance, your doc doesn't say, go get an MRI. Your doc sends a referral to your insurance company and your insurance company says, um, tells you to go to, the out, to some outpatient imaging center same quality, just different provider, um, where your insurance company has negotiated a price in advance. And that nego negotiated price, let's say, is $500 as opposed to $2,000. So first of all, they've negotiated a price, right? Um, so that's a benefit to you. Uh, and then on top of that, because you have insurance, uh, maybe you only have a cost share of 20%, so your cost is $100. Um, so that's, a, that's kind of the difference between having insurance and having them negotiate a payment for you and not. So kind of coming back to the quad model, private health insurance typically merges the payment and insurance functions for all the reasons I just talked about, right? Um, now you could think about um, some government services like Medicare um, merges the financing, the payment and the insurance function together. Um, 
the National Health Service in Great Britain merges all four functions, as does the military health system, for example, um, and the Indian health services. Uh, are, are all examples of, of services that merge all these together. But what we're primarily focused on in the United States, the model that we see primarily is insurance as a merger of payment and insurance functions. So why merge? Um, why do we merge these payments? Well, think about, um, uh, so continue with this kind of thought. Think about if you have car insurance or homeowners insurance, in your case, maybe renter's insurance. Those insurances are based on incidents that happen, right? So you're driving in a snowstorm and you lose control of the car and you run into a tree. You file a claim. Um, if your car is, is worth anything, um, they send you reimbursement for either the repairs or they total out the car and they send you the value of, you know, a check for the value of the car. If you own a house, um, common, like I came out of Texas, I retired out of Texas, get a fair amount of hailstorms down there. So hailstorm comes, does a bunch of damage to your roof. You file a claim with your um, uh, homeowner's insurance and they send out an adjuster. They look at the cost of the uh, of repair and then they send you a check to, to get the, uh, the roof repaired. Health insurance functions a little differently. Um, with these, you know, car and homeowners insurance, you're focused on an individual incident, right? You don't have like an accumulated impact on your on your home typically over the course of a year or on your car. It's it's a single, you know, your deductible is a result. It comes off of each incident. With health insurance, you're kind of insuring the cumulative expenditure over a period of time, like a year. So you're not insuring necessarily against a single event, like, oh, I got cancer and now I need, you know, now the insurance company is going to pay. Um, or, oh, I fell and broke my leg and the company's, the insurance company is going to pay for that, but they're not going to pay for all the little nitnoid things that happen. Like I go to the doctor because I have a cold, right? Instead, what health and the way health insurance works is, at the beginning of the year, you start from zero and you start spending money on your healthcare and you send the insurance company the bills and they add that up. You know, so you go in for hundred dollars, you go in for $200, right? You get an x-ray, that's another $200. You add all, and that all adds up and gets counted against a what's called a deductible, which we'll get to in a, you know, some of the components in a minute, right? Um, and once you reach that deductible, then the insurance company starts to help you pay additional um, for additional costs over and above that, that you incur in the course of a year. Um, and if you hit a high enough point, usually most insurance companies, uh, except for Medicare Part B, have a catastrophic cap or an out of, uh, out of pocket maximum, uh, at which point the insurance company pays everything. So typically it's beneficial to the insurance companies to keep those claims low, right? Um, because if, if the claims stay low, the premiums can stay low. And if the premiums are low, that makes them more attractive to additional customers, right? And so insurance, insurance companies with lower premiums uh, are more attractive to, you know, employers who are looking to, to contract with an insurance company or individuals. Um, and so it makes them more, more competitive. So, so there is a benefit to the insurance company to uh, negotiate good rates, um, with providers so that they can charge low rates to you as a consumer, not because they're nice, right? I, I'm not going to assert that insurance executives are nice people. They, some of them are perfectly nice people. I've met, I know a number of them, um, but their motivation at the end of the day is to make money. Well, the way that they make money is to actually provide you good service uh, and provide you a low, lower cost. One of the things that makes them good is lower costs. So, I, I want to talk a little bit about risk rating. It's an important concept. Um, uh, two kinds of risk rating. So in your book, that we talk about this. I'm going to hit this pretty fast, but it's really important concept to have in your head. There's experience rating, which is kind of like your car insurance, right? Those of you, I know you guys, uh, some of you might have led lead in your shoes and you drive a little fast, right? Well, what's the bad thing? Aside from getting a ticket, if you get caught speeding, what happens is your insurance company finds out about it and they raise your rates. 
that's an example of experience rating, right? And so uh, health insurance operates the same way. If you're, if you've got, if the insurance company knows you've got diabetes and you've got an individual insurance plan, they know you're going to spend a lot of money. And so they know your medical loss is going to be high. And so they're going to charge you a higher premium based on your expected medical loss. Same with groups. If you have an, if you have a group <coughs> program, insurance uh, uh, plan uh, and everybody in the group is old, they're going to, that, that the premium that the insurance company quotes you is going to be old. Um, and so this is experience rating. Community rating, on the other hand, is based on a population. So for example, um, uh, we would look at uh, if we had community rating, we look at everybody who lives in Durham and they would, and the insurance companies would look at how much money was, how much medical expen expenditures happened in Durham, divide that by the number of people who live in Durham and they'd come up with an expected uh, medical loss, right? And then they'd base the premium on that. Um, so, sorry, let me back up. Experience rating is really bad for sick old people because when you've been called out as being that old sick person with, you know, uh, various illnesses, you're going to have to pay more. But the good side is if you're young and healthy, like you guys, you're going to pay less, right? Under community rating, everybody pays the same. Well, that isn't particularly fair to the young, healthy people, because suddenly you're going to have to pay a higher rate because you're getting lumped in with me and all my, uh, all the old codgers that live in Durham, right? Uh, who need a lot of healthcare, uh, you know, because we've been living hard and uh, for all these years um, and not taking care of ourselves, right? And so, um, so you have a tendency to uh, young people don't like young healthy people don't like community rating. The ACA brought in and forced community rating. Now, what's the main benefit? Um, well, there's a couple. One of which is uh, uh, under community rate under the ACA and under community rating. Um, insurance companies can't deny uh, insurance to people with pre-existing conditions because that's essentially experience rating, right? If you say, hey, you've got a, you've got a pre-existing condition, I'm going to raise your rates to some astronomical number that basically you can't afford. Um, that's an example of experience rating. Uh, instead, what the ACA said was, you've got to charge people based on geography and you can adjust it based on age and tobacco use. And that's it. That's all you can do. Um, so, uh, and the age is broken down in some cat broad categories. Um, so, uh, so, so if you happen to live in an area with a lot of sick people and you're a young, healthy person, you better pack up and move someplace else because you're going to be paying a lot of money. Um, so, uh, so this is called um, uh, uh, adjusted um, uh, community rating, right? Where they can adjust for geography, age, and tobacco use, but that's it. So under community rating, even when adjusted, we're going to wind up with higher premiums for young, healthy people. Uh, some important ideas that your book kind of separates, but, but are usually discussed uh, jointly. One is moral hazard. Uh, the other is adverse selection. So moral hazard, uh, and they're both the result of what we call, uh, what economists call asymmetric information, which means one person knows something that the other doesn't. But they have, a, but they're in a, a relationship, right? Um, so, moral hazard means you're going to take more risks because you're protected from the consequences. Um, so, in healthcare, for example, uh, if you've got good health insurance, maybe you'll go do something more risky because you know if you get hurt, uh, the insurance company will make you whole. So, like going back to Archibald and his skiing uh, example, right? If he knew that. Uh, he had a one in a hundred chance of, of having a $30,000 uh, incident that might leave him homeless. He'd probably be like, you know what? I, I, I got to give up skiing. But if he knows instead, you know what? All I got to do is pay $350. And um, if I get hurt, uh, the insurance company make me whole. I'm definitely skiing. Definitely. Skiing. You know what? Not only am I going to ski, I'm going to ski twice as often. Right. And at which point he actually increases his likelihood of getting hurt. That's an example of moral hazard. He's taking more risk now because he knows that the insurance company is going is going to protect him from the consequences of his decision. I mean, he still break his leg. That still sucks, but he won't have to pay for it, right? Um, so that's moral hazard. That's when uh, you know that if if you get in trouble, somebody's going to bail you out. So it probably you can think of a number of stories from your childhood where 
you know, you did something that your parents didn't want you to do. Uh, but you knew that if you, if you got, you know, in, if, 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 if things went wrong, they'd, they'd, they'd bail you out. Maybe, maybe not even, um, metaphorically speaking. Uh, and then adverse selection is a related idea and it's particularly pernicious in insurance. Uh, and adverse selection basically says, you know, you're getting into a contract with somebody and one party has a lot more information than the other. So for example, if you're looking to buy health insurance, you're going to be a lot more excited about buying health insurance if you know you have a pre-existing condition or if you know you're likely to get hurt. Um, you know, maybe you uh, are a skier, right? A competitive skier, for example. A good chance you're going to break something in the course of a season or you're going to need some care in the course of a season as opposed to, you know, old old fart like me that, you know, basically like goes snowshoeing or something at pretty low, uh, low risk. Um, you know, I had a, I had a kind of real story, real, real story here. My best man in my wedding, um, when he was in his early twenties, got really, really sick and kind of long story short, turned out he had amongst other things, type one diabetes, um, and or late onset, but type one diabetes, uh, uh, hypothyroidism, which means his thyroid stopped working and, uh, uh something Atkinson's disease. I forget what it's called, but it, his adrenal gland also stopped working. And he just, he at in his early twenties became a total train wreck. And if you, and this guy is like totally in shape, very athletic, very outdoorsy, you know, goes hiking and biking and all this stuff. So he's not like a fat, lazy turd sitting around all the time playing video games. He's actually a, he's a physically active guy. So when he got sick, he just had no idea what was going on. Took him a while to figure out, took the, the his providers a while to figure out, oh man, because, because he was so healthy, like, wow, you got all these crazy things going on. Um, flash forward, he gets a real job. Uh, uh, as a computer programmer, and he gets presented with um, uh, the various uh, health insurance options. He chooses one that has a high deductible, low premium, because it was cheap. And then he realized in the first year they had it, he realized, man, I've got all these medical expenses uh, because I'm a diabetic with all these, you know, medical conditions. And he's got to take, you know, multiple medications every day. They're not particularly expensive, but he's got to give himself injections. You know, it just kind of sucks. Um, uh, so he's a very expensive, he's, he's got a very high medical loss, right? His, his, his medical expenses are very high. So the next year, he switched to a different plan from his provider that's an HMO plan that has a very low um, deductible and, uh, uh, and cost him a little more in terms of premiums, but he uh, knew he was going to have to use a lot of insurance. So this is an example where of asymmetric information. He knew how sick he was, and so he chose the higher benefit health plan. Had he been his young, slightly younger, uh, super healthy self, he would, it would have made more sense for him to go with the high deductible plan because it would have saved him money. So the problem is that the people, the sickest people want to buy the most comprehensive health insurance and the healthiest people want the least expensive health insurance. And insurance companies know this. And so they adjust their premiums based on it. But this is a problem for them. Um, and, and it can result in what's called the death spiral. Um, the death spiral is, uh, you know, uh, is, is this insurance concept. Um, and I'm going to talk it really quickly. So let's go to community rating now, right? All of a sudden we go away from experience rating so that the insurance company no longer knows just how young and healthy you are and instead lumps you in with old farts like me, right? And, and they kind of split the difference in terms of cost. Um, my insurance rate goes way down because now I'm combined with you who they expect to have very low costs and you, but your premiums go way up because now you're being lumped in with me. I actually don't have that bad uh, health. I'm, I'm pretty good shape um, mostly, but I, you know, make fun of myself. Okay. So, so, but regardless, I'm 50 and you're 20 or ish, right? So no matter what, the insurance company is going to charge you a lot less than they would me. So we lump us together and they can adjust for age. So there's a little bit of a story here, but if you get lumped together with an old, with old sick people, your premiums are going to go up. And so you're going to, you being a rational uh, individual will do a cost benefit analysis and say, you know what? 
these premiums. That's kind of crazy. I'm not going to pay that. I'm just going to, you know, go without insurance. A lot of people who are uninsured in this country are young people like you who've made that decision, who've said, you know what, this is this is BS. I don't want to pay, you know, a thousand dollars a month for insurance that I don't need. I'm just not going to do it. If I get sick, uh, you know, you can come take my mountain bike or something because I have nothing to pay you with. Take my two thousand dollar car, whatever, right? And so young people who say, wow, that premium's too high. I'm out, right? Like Shark Tank. I'm out. Right, and so they they get out of uh, out of the uh, insurance. They drop the insurance, um, and what happens? Well, now there are fewer young, healthy people in the pool, and there are, relatively speaking, the only people who are left are the old, sick people. So the insurance company says, "Well, per person now, we're going to have a higher medical loss uh, 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 amount, and so we're going to raise our premiums." Well, now the the young and super young and healthy people are out, but now the next tier of people who are maybe not as young and healthy, but they're not old and, and sick say, you know what, I'm out too, right? And so the pool keeps shrinking and who stays? The people who stay are the, are the sick, sickest, oldest, most frail, most likely to, um, you know, to use their insurance, like my friend who has no choice, right? He's, he's, even though he's, if you looked at him, he's a, even now he's 50, but uh, like me, but, um, but he's still, he's still a very outdoorsy guy, does a lot of exercise. So he's very healthy despite his, his challenges. Um, but he uses a lot of healthcare because of all his challenges. So what happens is we get this spiral of increasing premiums because all the healthier people keep dropping out and dropping out and the insurance market falls apart. So this is why kind of the end, the, the, the punchline of the story is the ACA has an insurance mandate uh, because des the designers knew that if they, that they, they knew a, that they were going to raise rates on young, healthy people like you uh, by doing the community rating thing and B, uh, that you would be likely to jump out if you were allowed to. And so they created this mandate that said, yeah, if you jump out, we're gonna charge you a big fee. All right, uh, some insurance terms. These are gonna be important for your, uh, for your plan evaluation. So you need to know premium, that's the dollar amount charged by the insurer for a specific set of benefits in a plan, right? So we have these different insurance plans and they come with different premiums. A deductible, is the amount of money that you have to you have to uh, pay in this case um, for a uh, for healthcare if it's health insurance you have to pay yourself out of pocket and then you show the insurance company yes I've paid this bill I've paid this bill up to some dollar amount at which point um, the insurance starts to pay uh, along with you they they begin paying some portion of of those payments so you hit your deductible let's say your deductible is a thousand dollars. You go to the doctor a bunch of times, you get some tests and you hit that thousand dollars. Every dollar after that, the insurance company is gonna step in and help you pay. And they're either going to, you're either going to have a co-payment, which is a flat fee um, uh, that you pay when accessing particular type of care. So for example, $35 or a percentage um, uh, of the allowable charges. So let's say you get to that thousand and then you have a hundred dollar um, $100 doctor's visit. If you have a 20% copay, um, you would pay $20, 20% of 100, and the insurance company would pay $80. And so you'd keep doing that. And the insurance company would keep track of how much money you've spent. So you'd have that $1,000 up to your deductible, and then you'd have all these copays and coinsurances that would add up. And at some point, most um, insurance companies have a what they call an out-of-pocket maximum or a catastrophic cap, um, which is <clears throat> the maximum amount that you're allowed to pay out of pocket. And that's usually a pretty big number, 5,000, 8,000, 10,000, something like that. That's the accumulation of the money you spent before you met your deductible, plus all your co-payments and co-insurance. And once you hit that deductible, excuse me, that out-of-pocket maximum, after that, the insurance company just pays everything 100%. That's allowable, right? Um, so it has to be uh, stuff that that you're insured for in your plan. It's not gonna, they're not gonna play for arbitrary things. Um, okay, so, uh, so some other terms that you need to know. Network provider. So we talked a minute ago about that payment function. So 
health insurance companies, when they set up a plan, will often develop what they call a provider network. So they'll say, hey, Wentworth Douglas, do you want to be, you know, we're providing insurance for UNH. Do you want to be our preferred provider for inpatient services? And Wentworth Douglas says, let's talk about how much I'm going to charge for that. And so the insurance company and Wentworth Douglas sit down and they negotiate prices. And then they might also include Portsmouth Regional or Exeter Hospital, whatever. And they pre-negotiate prices. And, and then Wentworth Douglas and, you know, other hospitals maybe become part of the network. So if you get sick and you need a, a hospital care, your insurance company is going to say, we are partnered with Wentworth Douglas. They are part of our network. You can go see them. Um, but let's say you, uh, you decide, you know what? I really like to go to Catholic Medical Center over in Manchester. It's not that far. I, I can drive there. And your insurance company says, well, we didn't negotiate with Catholic Medical Center. And so they're not part of our network. So if you go to an out of network provider, very often you have to um, pay a significant portion uh, uh, of that cost out of pocket, or they have a, a maximum that they'll pay, or they may not pay anything. They may say, you know what? We don't pay for you to go to uh, out of network providers. End of discussion. If you want to go to Catholic Medical Center, that's good. It's going to come all out of your pocket. Um, so on the bill you get, you're typically going to see the amount that the provider charges, and then you're going to see another column that says amount allowed. That's going to be the negotiated rate set by the insurer. So um, Medicare Part B is um, for professional services. Whoops. Just wanted to move my little image over. It covers things like physician services and um, if you get other outpatient uh, services like maybe getting an x-ray or something like that. Uh, it doesn't include drugs. Um, so uh, part B, right? The premium uh, in 2021 uh, was uh, $148 a month, right? And that's a per person premium. So if it's your grandparents and they're married, they each have to pay $148 a month. Pretty dirt cheap, frankly, uh, for the level of benefit that Medicare Part B represents. Uh, there is a deductible, an annual deductible of $203, which is really easy to meet, right? That's basically like one doctor's visit. Um, uh, and then after you meet your deductible, you pay coinsurance of 20%. Um, one of the scary things about Medicare Part B is there is no out-of-pocket maximum. So it's easy to meet the deductible of $203, right? That's, like I said, basically like one maybe two primary care visits. And then after that, your uh, Medicare will kick in um, and pay 80% and you pay 20%. So let's say um, it costs you $110 for one doctor visit, $100 for the next doctor visit. You've now hit your deductible. And so that next doctor's visit that say costs $100, um, Medicare is going to pay $80 and you're going to pay $20. That's what the coinsurance is. The danger with Medicare Part B, if all you have is Medicare Part B, is if you wind up getting really sick um, and ring up tens of thousands of dollars in, in um, uh, uh, costs, so like you get cancer, for example, it's easy to ring up a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in costs, you're going to be on the hook for 20% of that. So let's say you wind up with $100,000 in care because you have cancer, you're on the hook for $20,000 right? Because there is no out-of-pocket uh, maximum with Medicare Part B. Um, so I do this little example. Uh, I'm going to skip this, but you can think about it uh, after because I'm running a little long. You can look at, um, okay, so I want to talk about exchange plans. So I do want to you to look at this. So I'm going to escape out of, whoop. Uh, and I'm going to bring up, so here's healthcare.gov. So you're going to be doing a, a um, plan comparison. So one way you could get an, a sample plan is to go to healthcare.gov. I've got this link both in this presentation as well as in Canvas uh, in the module. I think it's module week three because that's when the, the plan is is due, the plan analysis is due. So if you click through here to, to healthcare.gov, 
backslash C hyphen plans. Um, you can go here and plug in a zip code. So I'm going to do uh, 03431. So this is Cheshire County. This is where I went to high school. My dad worked uh, uh, at Cheshire Medical Center for many, many years. Click here to continue. It tells you, gives you a bunch of choices about like if you were for real looking to buy a plan on the healthcare exchange. Um, so this is the Obamacare exchanges, right? So in New Hampshire, we don't have a state exchange. We use the 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 ACA exchange, the national exchange. Um, if you think you could qualify for a benefit, you'd go in here and tell them a bunch of stuff about yourself. You can just skip that step and just look at the plans. So we're going to do that. We're going to see, see full price plans. I'm going to go here, uh, close that. And I get a list of plans sorted uh, with the lowest premium. And the one I'm going to look at is this Ambetter Essential Care um, which is a low cost plan. Uh, and it gives you some basic stuff here. Like for example, the deductible is $7,200. Let that sink in for a second. The insurance company pays nothing for you until you have spent $7,200. That's an individual, this is an individual plan. So if you young single person decide, you know what, I'm gonna buy a plan on the exchange. Uh, it's gonna cost me $236 a month but the insurance doesn't pay anything until I have rung up $7,200 in expenses. So this is called a high deductible uh, insurance plan um, because that's a lot of money. Now, the benefit of this is if you're working with Ambetter um, uh, uh, with this plan, they have built a network, right? We're gonna click through here. They have built a network and they have negotiated prices. So even though the insurance side of this is pretty significant, like that's a lot of money, $7,200 deductible, um, you do get a big advantage, which is you can work with them to find a physician where they have pre-negotiated relatively low prices for care, right? And so you get that benefit. Um, so what's interesting about this is the deductible is 7,200, but the out-of-pocket maximum is 8,400. So once you've hit the uh, deductible, it doesn't take that much more spending to hit the out-of-pocket maximum. So basically what you're buying in, in my mind is, you know, roughly like uh, you're really buying the out-of-pocket maximum. Uh, you're protecting yourself against, against uh, costs that are going to exceed $8,400 a year, uh, given how close the deductible is to the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, so we can click through here. If you decide you want to use one of these uh, exchange plans, um, they're all structured the same, like what I'm showing you here. So you can go down here to plan documents and then click on the summary of benefits and it'll kick up a, um, uh, a PDF file and I'm finding I'm having to refresh it. There we go. And it gives you a standardized summary um, of the plan's benefits. I'll zoom this up a little bit. Uh, and so they, what's nice about this is because they, on this site, in order to have a, in order to have a plan on this site, you have to follow this, you have to lay it out exactly the same. So we already said the deductible is 7,200. If you have a family, it's 14,4. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, are there other services covered? Yes, you can get preventative care. I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. Um, that preventative care, there's some specific preventative care that's covered, uh, that's, quote, free, right? They're not allowed to charge you a, 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 a co-pay or co-insurance for. Um, uh, for network providers, um, uh, uh, it's 8,400. If you go outside um, the net, to non-network providers, I th think in this case, there is no out-of-pocket limit. Um, so what is not included in the out-of-pocket limit? Well, you, your premiums don't count towards uh, your deductible or your out-of-pocket limit. Um, if you go to a non-network provider, they can engage in what's called balance billing. So your insurance company might say, you might go to a, a non, you know, like the example here, uh, and I'm just 
using Catholic because I just talked about it a minute ago. You decide, you know, I want to go get my MRI at Catholic. And Catholic says, okay, come on over. We're happy to do it. Uh, and they send you a bill for $2,000. And Ambetter says, you know what? We pay $500 for uh, MRIs. And so they pay Catholic $500. And then Catholic turns to you and says, you owe us $1,500. And you're like, what, what, what? I didn't know. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because we're out of network and we're allowed to balance bill you, which means we can bill you the patient for the balance between what your insurance company uh, agreed to pay and what we say our charge is. So that's why you want to stay with in-network uh, providers if at all possible. Uh, so then let's scroll down and what they show you is some, some specific situations like <clears throat> if you go to a primary care, uh, go for primary care visit to treat an illness or injury, um, they pay uh, 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 50% coinsurance and your deductible does not apply. So what does this mean? This means, let's say you're sick and you go to an in-network provider, your primary care doc, and your prim primary care doc says, uh, you know, uh, looks like you've got a cold, take, uh, take two Advil and, you know, don't call me. Um, and here's my bill for $100. Well, even if you haven't met your deductible yet, uh, they're going to cover 50%. Uh, the insurance company is going to pay 50% of the bill. So, even if you haven't hit that 70, that crazy deductible of what was it, $7,200, um, they're going to pay, because it's primary care and they're encouraging you to use primary care, they'll pay $50 of the $100 bill. Now, that does go towards the, the 50 you pay does go towards the deductible and does go toward um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, out of pocket maximum. And then if you go over here and you see and you see this, what's kind of cool is virtual visits from Ambetter uh, Health cover, are covered at zero dollars. So if you use their if you use their telehealth service, you can you get it for free. So they're really trying to encourage that. If you go to see a specialist, <clears throat> uh, you pay fifty percent, and that would be up to the deductible. Uh, uh, excuse me, after the deductible. Um, so. Prior to the deductible, you would pay 100%. After the deductible, you'd pay 50%. Um, preventative care, there's no charge, and we have a list of that, and we'll show it. I'll show it to you. Um, uh, diagnostic tests such as X-rays or blood work, again, 50% after you hit your deductible. Um, drugs, uh, generics. We talked about generics last time and, and why they're valuable. Well, um, here. Uh, if you get generics at a uh, retail, uh, uh, the copay, copay as opposed to coinsurance. So here it was a percentage. Here it's going to be 25 bucks. So if I go to the doctor and maybe I've got an infection, you know, I've got a cut that got infected and I have cellulitis, uh, I go to the doctor, they're like, yeah, you got cellulitis. Uh, here's a prescription for amoxicillin. You go to Rite Aid. Um, the, if you get generic amoxicillin, uh, you pay $25. And again, the deductible does not apply. So even if you haven't hit your deductible yet, the copay is just $25. Uh, or, or the cost to you out of pocket is just $25. If you use a brand branded drugs, um, there's uh, 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 a 50% coinsurance after you hit your deductible. Um, okay. And then there's some more information here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, if you have, and then they go through a whole bunch of other things. It's cool. Uh, this lays it out really plainly as to what's happening. So if you go to have outpatient surgery, <clears throat> say at a, uh, at a hospital or at an ambulatory surgery center, 50% uh, uh, coinsurance. Oh, by the way, if you go to see an out-of-network provider, they don't pay anything. <laughs> so this is a real bare bones uh, uh, program here, right? So you definitely don't want to get care if it's non-emergency uh, uh, outside of the network. Um, uh, and then, so, so this would be an example, like if you go to, sorry, if you go to outpatient surgery, um, uh, 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 you get, you have to pay 50% 
after you hit your deductible. And again, this deductible here is huge, right? Uh, but if you get if you get in surgery, chances are you'll hit that that deductible really easily, um, because surgery costs a lot of money. Um, if you need immediate medical attention, so now here you're they're not punishing you quite as much because um, uh, they can't because um, they've got to cover. If you've got to, got to go to the emergency room, you go to the emergency room, but it's 50% of whatever the bill is, right? After you hit your deductible. So really expensive. Um, if you call an ambulance, 50% again, and man, ambulance uh, uh, rides are <laughs> really expensive. Um, don't ever call an ambulance unless you literally are life limb or eyesight risk. Um, and then urgent care, uh, they're trying to direct you away from emergency room care because it's expensive to use urgent care. And so urgent care is a $60 copay. Uh, and, and again, they're not hitting you with the deductible. So that's nice. So there's some other stuff here you could look at. Um, I'm going to flip back uh, to... Lecture. Hang on one sec. Uh, all right. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure I've got that going. Um, okay, so that's that's that. Um, preventive services, I, I mentioned, and I'm going to, uh, there's a link here you can look at. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. So all adults are entitled to free uh, immunizations against things like flu and measles. These are not really free. They're, they're included in the medical costs that the, that the insurance company uses to calculate your premium. So it's basically, you've already paid for it in your premium. This is part of the reason why after the ACA, everybody's premiums went up. It's because they used to make you pay a copay, for example, for your flu and measles shots. Now they're not allowed to do that. So they just rolled it all into the cost of the premium, right? Women are allowed to get a bunch of other stuff, uh, breast and breast cancer, mammography screenings, and birth control, which was a really controversial part of the um, ACA, even though the dollar amount is relatively low. Um, so kind of types of, of uh, health, ins of, of individual, or excuse me, of private health insurance. We've got individual private health insurance, <coughs> group health insurance, which kind of is a couple of different flavors. Uh, so we've talked about individual. That's just me, you know, uh, contacting uh, Aetna and saying, I need an individual insurance. So I have a friend who's a photographer, a professional photographer. And for many years before the ACA came in, um, he just contracted with a local, uh, or, or not local, but with a with an insurance company directly. Uh, after the ACA came in, they the, the insurance company went out of business because they couldn't meet all the requirements and stay profitable. So now he goes to the health insurance exchange and buys an individual plan from the health insurance exchange. Health insurance exchanges are basically group insurance. So the thing we were just looking at is a group insurance. So it's 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 basically looking at everybody that buys their plan through the exchange. Um, you can also have kind of commercial or employer-based group health insurance. So um, uh, 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 I can, as a faculty member, I get group health insurance. Uh, I can get group health insurance through UNH. Um, so if, if UNH was a smaller employer, they might contract with a uh, health insurance company uh, to negotiate coverage for all their people. And they would buy the insurance from the company, uh, from the health insurance company. Large employers like UNH, and they do this, I know, um, uh, self-insure. So basically, they take everybody who's covered by you know, UNH health insurance or everybody who's employed by UNH, and they put us all in one big pool. And then they contract with a, um, with a health insurance company. And in, right now, it's Cigna. It used to be Aetna, I think. Right now, it's Cigna. And so Cigna doesn't perform the insurance function. UNH self-insures what Cigna does is it function does the payment function. So it does all the things like it negotiates a uh, um, a provider network for us. 
it then negotiates prices with that provider network and it structures a benefit. And basically, so basically UNH self-insures, so they take all the risk. So if I get really sick, if I had UNH health insurance and I got really sick, <clears throat> UNH would be paying the bills, but you know, would be financing it, I should say, right? But Cigna would be the one that's actually like writing the checks and then then they'd send a big bill to UNH and they'd be like hey we paid you know we paid for health insurance for all these different people um so uh uh so that's an example of self insurance and then UNH if something went really catastrophically wrong um and this happens a lot with uh babies so you get a what's 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 uh, referred to as a bad baby um, or a sour baby uh, in the industry right is is a baby that maybe is is um, a preemie right or has some sort of congenital um, birth defects that were uh, you know unexpected or maybe they were expected regardless um, uh, baby's born winds up going to the NICU the neonatal intensive care unit and my and very uh, babies will ring up million dollar bills in no time at all, um, and so UNH, you know, has kind of an expected uh, payout of some amount of money. But if if they get a couple of of bad babies or babies that go sour uh, in a given year, um, uh, their medical loss level right, their expenses, their medical expenses might skyrocket. And so what they do is they engage, they purchase insurance on their insurance. So they've got kind of a predicted range, you know, let's say they expect to spend $10 million on, on health expenses uh, in, in, in the form, you know, and they collect 10 million, you know, $10 million in premiums um, between deductions from our sal reductions in our salaries, as well as we pay in uh, to UNH as, as a faculty, as part of the pool. Um, so they expect to spend 10 million, but there's a couple of sour babies and the price goes to 20 million. Well, maybe they self-insure up to 12 million and they have a policy, a reinsurance policy that says, after uh, 12 million, um, the reinsurer picks up uh, the tab. And so there are companies that do this. You may have heard of Lloyd's of London is a really famous uh, reinsurer. Okay. Um, we've talked about Medicare a bit. I wanna hit a couple of different government services and I'm gonna talk about them fairly quickly. Uh, Medicare comes in four parts, four parts. So you have part A covers hospital insurance, Part B is that supplementary medical insurance basically covers professional services like physician fees. So the hospital insurance just pays the hospital for inpatient stays. The supplementary medical insurance covers all of the services that you get from physicians, anesthesiologists, physical therapy, you know, radiology, all that stuff. This one, A, has no uh, premium. You just automatically get it at 65. At 65, you have to start paying that premium that I showed you. Part D is an, a, a third part that was brought in uh, in the early 2000s by the Bush administration, the W. Bush administration. <clears throat> and this was to provide prescription drug coverage because parts A and B don't cover prescription drugs. Um, and prescription drugs are really expensive. And we talked about in the, in the technology lecture, they're substitutes for surgery for a lot of things, for inpatient stays, right? More and more, these drugs are amazing what they can do and what they can prevent. And so they're really valuable, but they're really expensive, right? So we talked about the Harvoni that can cure hepatitis C, uh, something that would have been a chronic lifetime disease, uh, uh, right? But that Harvoni was, what we said, $95,000. Um, so A, B, and D, you typically might have A, B, and D, or you'll have C. That's why C is out of order. C is called Medicare Advantage. It's a managed care option, and it basically substitutes for A, B, and D. Um, so it is a. It, it is a. It was also started under the uh, W. Bush administration with the idea that insurance instead of having the government perform the insurance and payment function. The government just performs the financing function and pays, if you choose to be a Medicare Part C beneficiary, 
the federal government pays a, writes a check uh, to the um, to the managed care organization a fixed fee, right? And then the Medicare uh, the the med, uh, managed care organization that you contract with uh, uh, or you sign on with provides all your benefits uh, in lieu of your A, B, and D options. Now, if you have A and B, historically, you might have bought Medigap. Remember, I was talking, uh, explaining part B, that co uh, copay, excuse me, co uh, co-insurance function, you're on the hook for 80, per, excuse me, for 20% of your part B costs with no limit. So if it goes to 100,000 or 200,000, you just got to keep on paying. You got to keep on paying that 20%. There's no limit there. So what a lot of folks do is they buy a Medigap uh, uh, program that basically, uh, or, or not program, uh, policy that basically provides them a, a, a cap, a catastrophic cap or an out-of-pocket maximum that Medicare itself doesn't provide. Um, so Medigap is sort of like the supplementary insurance that you can buy. Um, so we have various poverty pro programs, Medicaid and, and children's health insurance program. Um, we've talked enough about those in the past and your book does a pretty good job explaining it. I want to cover these other issues though. So reimbursement. Uh, <clears throat> historically, we have operated under a fee for service uh, reimbursement. One of those is uh, historically was cost plus. This used to be basically uh, the uh, it's uncommon now. There's a few providers that are allowed to do this. Critical access hospitals are allowed to bill like this. Um, what this operates as is the provider would be uh, retrospectively paid. So they would report the cost of providing care. So let's say it cost they, they report it said it cost us a hundred dollars to provide you that care. What um, under a under a cost plus arrangement, they would then be reimbursed one hundred and five dollars. Let's say if, if they had a cost plus of five percent, they'd be paid one hundred and five dollars. What this encourages is they want to just crank churn you through and do a whole bunch of of care because they get five percent of it, and so five percent of a big number is more than five percent of a small number. So they want that cost to be big. It basically encourages overspending. In the 80s, um, and this is what happened once Medicare came online and Medicaid came online, it was initially fee for service plus cost plus, and they and 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 hospitals are run by smart people. And they're like, hey, whoa, if we really ring up a lot of expenses, we can, you know, we make a whole bunch of money. Um, and so that's what they did. They rang up a bunch of expenses and they made a whole bunch of money. It took the government. 25 years or so to figure it out. Uh, but then they implemented, uh, well, 20 years. Uh, then they implemented this prospective payment system initially on um, inpatient care and then uh, eventually was extended to outpatient care as well. And basically what this means is prospective payment, prospective means before, they negotiated prices for specific services. So they said, if you're coming in uh, for uh, uh, uh uh, bypass surgery. Um, we're going to pay you, uh, pay you the hospital X thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, let's say, right? And and that's all we're going to pay you, uh, unless you can prove that this case was particularly complicated, in which case we'll give you a a a, a bump up for that. But based on what we call a DRG, a diagnostic related diagnosis related group DRG, we're going to pay you a fixed fee. So that's the prospective nature of it. Later on came APCs, ambulatory procedure codes, and RVUs, which I want to talk about in a second. Evolving and coming is capitation. We've been trying this for a few years. Some organizations do it. Uh, capitation basically says the provider basically agrees to take a fixed fee um, uh, uh, to provide all the care that, um, uh, that a beneficiary needs. This incentivizes providers to provide better health and reduce utilization. This is kind of what we want. Bundled payments, we heard about in the uh, uh, Surgery Center of Oklahoma talk. He talked about, Keith Smith talked about how they offer bundles. So if you come in for knee surgery, that bundle is gonna, they're gonna quote you a dollar amount. 
And that bundle is going to include a preoperative evaluation with the surgeon. It's going to include the actual surgery. Um, it's going to include the anesthesia, labs, x-rays, whatever else you might need. Um, facility charges, which include the facility charge includes all the services that, the, that are associated with the facility, you know, using the room, the, the surgical room, using um, the nursing support supplies, uh, as well as post-op care. So physical therapy, wound care. So those are bundles, and that's kind of a new thing also. Not quite decapitation, uh, but a step in that direction. <clears throat> uh, Fee-for-service reimbursement under uh, RBRVS, Resource-Based Relative Value Scale. This is how physicians get paid. Um, and it is, it the RBRVS assigns an uh, relative value in an, or an RVU to each service that a physician does. So there's a code. Everything that they do has a code. And so the code has an associated uh, RVU value. And then to calculate uh, under Medicare, you calculate um, a fee is a multiplier times the number of RVUs gives you the fee. So we'll look at this real quick. So these are some examples of codes that physicians use um, and their associated RVUs. So for example, if you go to see a doctor for the first time, um, for, so you go to see a primary care provider that's never seen you before. So she, when she sees you for the first time and you've got some mid-level, relatively uncomplicated condition, she'll code a 99203. You don't need to know the code numbers, um, but I'd like you to get the concept. That would be a work that generates a, um, three kinds of RVUs. So to, to come up with the total RVU, they have a work RVU, which is the amount of effort that the physician is supposed to have contributed to or, or put into providing the care. Um, you have a facility or non-facility RVU. So this is meant to capture the amount of physical resources and support that the physician relies on to provide the care. Um, and you can see a facility versus a non-facility. So a non-facility means that the provider provided the care in their own office. Facility RVU means that the provider provided the care in a hospital. And remember last time I talked about hospitals as doctors workshops. So, so this RVU number is going to generate a bill. The bigger the RVU, the more money the doctor gets paid. Well, the reason that the non-facility practice expense RVU is bigger than the facility practice expense RVU is because they're assuming when you're in a non-facility, so for example, they're working in a, their own office, they're having to provide all of the support to provide the care, which would include the, the building, nursing staff, and so on. And so they get a bigger number, a bigger RVU than if they're in a hospital, because what we're assuming there is most of the support is coming from uh, the hospital. So you either get uh, the non-facility RVU or the facility RVU, depending on where the physician provides the care. Then they get a malpractice RVU added on. So the MP RVU is the malpractice. And so um, the more complicated, more risky the service, the higher that malpractice number is. So the codes over here on the side, 99203 is an outpatient visit with a new patient. 99213, so it's just one digit difference, is a mid-level visit with an established patient. So this is, I've got a bit of a cold, I go to see the doctor that I've been seeing for two years, right? That's an established visit. And you can see the difference in RVUs because it's more work to take care of somebody you've never met before than it is to take care of somebody you have a long history with. And so that's what that represents. Now, these next three numbers, the 99213, 99214, and 99215 represent progressively more complex visits. So that's how this is coded in, in um, uh, uh, the systems that physicians use to get reimbursed. And so a 99213 is less complicated than a 99214. And so therefore the work RVUs are different as are all the other RVUs. 99215 is more complicated than 99214. And so it gets the even higher reimbursement. Some other examples of, of physician codes include uh, psychiatric treatment. Um, so this would be 
uh, uh, spending time uh, doing therapy, psychiatric therapy uh, with the patient for 60 minutes, they'd get, a th they'd get three RVUs. Um, if you go to the emergency room and get seen by an emergency physician, um, the uh, uh, emergency part department, the visit itself, the time you spend with the physician, this would be a mid-level visit. So this is not like a, you've been in a car wreck and you're, you're coding on the table. This is a, you know, there's something funny, you know, I can't, I can't wait until Monday. I've got a really bad headache or something like that. And they determine that all you've got is a migraine and they send you home, right? That would be a mid-level visit. Let's imagine, or it better yet, you fall and twisted your ankle and you can't, you come hobbling in, um, you know, that's not particularly complicated. It's bread and butter kind of thing. So they might code a 99283 for the visit. And then they add on to that, uh, putting a leg sprint splint on you. And the total, you total these two lines together to get the total RVUs. So how does this turn into a bill? Well, if you have a 99203 and you assume you're doing it in a doctor's office, you'd have 1.42 work RVUs, 1.47 facility RVUs, 0.15 uh, malpractice RVUs. There's an adjustment for geography. So in New Hampshire, you multiply the one times the 1.42, 1.04 times 1.47. We're not doing a facility RVU because we're assuming we're in an office. And then you... Uh, People of New Hampshire sue less, I guess, and so they get a slight decrease for the malpractice RVU. So you get this GPCI adjusted number, adds up to 3.1. The conversion factor is $36.09 per RVU. So 36.09 times 3.1 RVUs gives you a total bill of $111. That's what they would bill to Medicare. Here's the emergency room visit. You wound up with a um, 99283 for a mid-level emergency visit for the physician and then applying the leg splint. Emergency room doctors always operate in emergency rooms. So it's always going to be a facility version, uh, facility practice expense. And so um, uh, and we add those together to get the total RVUs. Then we multiply it by the various GPCIs, we get a total RV of 3.29. And so the bill, if you had a Medicare patient come in with a twisted ankle and they need an, a lower leg splint, you'd only bill them $118. All right. Um, so where are we going? Well, um, last two slides. Where are we going? Uh, Fee-for-service is moving towards value-based. What does that look like? Well, what's happening is um, uh, providers are agreeing to take capitated payments or pay or bundled payments. And so they're taking on more insurance risk. And so the risk is being transferred from the insurance company, right, to the delivery uh, services. And, in, uh, uh, and so, uh, less and less action is happening in the insurance companies and more and more is happening at the um, uh, provider level. In fact, a lot of providers are merging with insurance companies and are becoming basically integrated systems of a, a, a provider and an insurance company all in one. Um, and as that happens, right, we wind up... Um, combining these three functions together. Um, and so the provider now says, I'll take, you know, um, uh, I will cover your whole pot, you know, so they'd say, say to UNH, for example, so let's say MGB, Mass General, Brigham, the parent organization for Wentworth Douglas says to UNH, hey, look, uh, pay us $50 a month per, per, per insured member of your faculty. <clears throat> and we'll 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 take responsibility for all of their medical spend, right? Um, and so we'll take that flat payment, and we'll just provide care for all your people. And what we'll do is we'll make sure they stay well because that'll be our. In, we have an incentive to make sure they stay well because it, because we're getting that fixed payment, and if we can provide the care more cheaply, we'll make more profit. And so the movement now is from a fee for service where I pay for each thing that the, that the provider does to me to value-based, 
right? Ultimately, the ultimate kind of the, the holy grail of value-based care is the capitated payment. So you pay one fee, right? And then the organization, the provider organization takes responsibility for all the care. So that's where we're headed. And we'll talk more about that as we go. I stole this um, uh, uh, graphic from uh, uh, Dr. Joe Pepe, who is the CEO of, uh, of Catholic Medical Center, and a really good all around guy. Um, I sometimes joke about Catholic Medical Center, but it's a fabulous organization with great people. Um, and so uh, Joe came and talked to my class one time, Dr. Dr. Pepe came to my class one time and he used this slide and I, I stole it and I've been using it ever since. But basically what he said was, look, we're in a journey moving from fee-for-service to value-based. Uh, we want to get to that capitated situation where, where uh, patients or their employers pay us some fixed fee, and then we just, we just wrap around the patient with all the things that they need to keep them well, right? Uh, and we want to move away from that. You know, we pay you, we nickel and dime you. Every time you come to see us, we send you a bill for something, right? Um, and so, so his argument was, the industry today is is here um, with fee for service, right? Uh, and here uh, with value based. So uh, my conversation with any number of executives basically says, "Yeah, you know, we all want to get to this value based holy grail, uh, but about ninety five percent of our revenues come from fee for service, and about five percent come from some form of value based reimbursement." So we're we know we want to get here, but we're really stuck back here. And to get over here is going to be really difficult, especially as we approach this kind of flipping point, um, because it's going to require us to think about providing care in a completely different way than we have over the last, you know, a uh, couple thousand years, right? Um, medic, you know, medical care has always been paid, uh, provided basically on a fee-for-service uh, basis pretty much since the beginning of time. Um so we're going to eventually get, we want to eventually get uh, to here, um, but it's going to take some some challenge. So that's the goal. That's the holy grail. That's where we're going. Um, and that's enough for this chapter. <laughs>